Welcome to What a Creep, the show with Margot Donahue and Sonia Mansfield talking about creeps from the past to the present. This is your quick guide to the biggest creeps, jerks, assholes, and losers, the best of the worst. From two nice ladies who want the world to be a little less creepy. Welcome back to What a Creep. This is Margot Donahue, and my cohort in creepitude, as always, is the amazing Sonia Mansfield. Hey, Sonia. Hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. It is hot in the city tonight. Woo! 99 degrees, but none of that is going to stop me from catching no. creeps. That's just what we do. <laughs> if this is your first time listening to us, we are the show that talks about creeps from the past to the present. One of us picks a creep, and the other one is then charged to come up with a non-creep to complement the creep. Last week, we had Scott Bayo, so we picked Henry Winkler. It made everyone very, very happy. There's a lot of yes. Henry Winkler love in the world, Sonia. We need more of it. Yes, we do. I love it. In the world, be a Fonzie, not a Chachi. Right. Thank you. <laughs> We have a basic Facebook page, but we don't really use it. That's where people go to complain about our language. Yes, we use salty language on this program. Fuck yeah. <laughs> we have a private Facebook group. You have to answer a few questions to join the group, but that's where you can go to talk with other people about creeps and suggestions for the show and things like that. We are on Twitter at Creep Pie because somebody had what a creep for 10 years and never used it. Creep. And we are on Instagram at What a Creep Podcast. And please follow us at all those places if you like us. We also have a very old timey but useful email. It's <laughs> What a Creep Podcast at gmail.com. If you want stickers, send us a request. We'll send you some stickers. I just sent a couple out this week, Sonia. People have been asking there. That's Yay! also a great place to send us your suggestions for creeps and non creeps. Always find that helpful. And Sonia, can you tell them about the website? Yes. I, I also want to say that uh, I also describe myself as old-timey and useful. So <laughs> I really enjoy that description for email. You can find everything you ever wanted to know about our podcast, but we're afraid to ask at whatacreeppodcast.com. It has links to almost all of our episodes. The first five seasons are behind the Patreon wall. More on that in a bit. But all of our episodes are there, and they include links to our show notes. All of our episodes are sourced. We're not pulling the shit out of our ass. It is real stuff. We source everyone. We want everyone to get their credit for their hard work. Exactly. Uh, there's also a link to our merch shop. So if you would like t-shirts or face masks because COVID is still a thing or... Did I say tote bags? Tote bags. Face masks. Somebody um, bought a t-shirt the other day. And it said maybe next year. And actually, yeah. that always kind of works. Maybe next it year. Yeah. I'm like, that one's not going out of style. I bought a mug that says, damn it, Max. Um, I drink out of it all week long for work. And people love it because my dog loves to interrupt my meetings, and my podcasts. <laughs> Do you want to tell people about the Patreon page? Yes. If you go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look up What a Creep Podcast, we have a couple of very affordable options. It's just to help us pay for the costs of the show, the streaming services, and all the, all the stuff that we have, the software. All the subscriptions. All the subscriptions, everything. Yeah. We really appreciate it. I want to say thank you to Matthew slash Maxwell. Not sure which ah. one is your real name. Brandy and Lauren, thank you all for joining the Patreon group. Oh, also that you know, the first five seasons of the show are up there, including Bongo Crosby, or Bong Crosby, <laughs> I wrote. <laughs> and then you also put out two bonus episodes. We all also love it, by the way, if you um, have content ideas for bonus episodes, like shorter versions of Creeps and stuff like that. A couple of you have been doing that lately, and it's really yeah. helpful. We appreciate that. And also, you get a newsletter, which Sonia kicks ass and takes names oh, creating oh, for thank you guys. Thank you. That's so fun. Maybe in the next newsletter, I'll write all about Bong Crosby. <laughs> I'm dreaming of a high Christmas. A green Christmas. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is all very old timey. Sonia, have I forgotten everything? Have we gone through everything? I think we have. Then we have to continue with the show. This is what we do today. There are some creeps here, but it's more about a creepy event that happened. And there were good consequences that came from it. But 
it was a terrible thing that happened one day and it could have been prevented. Like a lot of things, you know, tragedies, they could have been prevented because people just didn't think they would happen. And we are talking today about the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. It happened March 25th, 1911 in New York City. And my question to you, Sonia, is are you aware of this thing at all? No, not at all. And I think the topic is super timely because there is a lot of talk about terrible working conditions yes. and toxic work environments and unions are becoming more unions used to be everywhere and then they mm -hmm. kind of got busted up and they're making a comeback don't call it a comeback they are <laughs> I mean, making please. a they're making a comeback and think you know places like Starbucks and um, Barnes and Noble and other places are trying to unionized. get unionized. Chipotle, I think, is trying to unionize. I'm all, it's dope. Amazon. Yeah. Do you have health care through your work? Thank a union for that. We're going to be talking about that today. So let's just dig into it, shall we? Yeah. One of the biggest workplace disasters in New York City happened on March 25th, 1911 in a factory on the Lower East Side, which would be described as a sweatshop. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of women were jammed together and a few men, but mostly it was women. And they were in one large room at sewing machines creating the fashionable shirtwaist blouses. So, Sonia, people used to make their own clothes. And then it was the rag industry started in New York and other places where they would mass produce shirts and pants and underwear and girdles and everything else, shoes, mm -hmm. everything you wanted. And if you get a lot of people to do it, you can make the price lower and then everybody can buy it. And shirt yes. waists were basically just fitted blouses. Something you would wear. Like they're, they, they're snug yes. and they sometimes have a pattern on them. Often they're just white and you just buy a bunch for the week and you pair right. it with a skirt and some boots and you're good to go. It was very, very fashionable. And this is also... Everything old is new again. There's something that's like available at a Chanel price, but you can get it at the Contempo Casuals. I'm just thinking of Miranda Priestley when I make. Yes, that. I was just thinking the, the <laughs> what is it the Krillian Kril blue or something? She gives the blue whole, or something? something like yeah, and she gives a whole breakdown of how and how that happens. That is what happens. I mean, the fashion yes. start with a couture. What am I thinking of the the couture it, couture? Thank you. Yes. In Paris in Rome, in London, all these like very bright, sparkly places. And then New Yorkers just make a quick, cheap version. Yes, as we do. This was, uh, it changed everything. It was like an outfit women could wear to go work in. It was presentable. You could wear it to church. You could wear it to the beach and have your bathing suit underneath. Anyway, it, it buttoned up front. And because it was just a blouse, it came on and off pretty easily. It yeah. used to have to be all this crap you had to put on. The fire began at the Asher building, it was on the eighth floor and eventually took over several floors in the building. The doors were locked where the women were working. There were no sink sprinkler systems in place. Fire ladders could only reach the sixth floor at the time. New York, oh, they were building them 10 floors and higher. That was big, the thing. 146 people died that day. Most of them were women and young girls. The youngest victims were two girls aged 14. The deaths of these people led to some of the most important workers' rights legislation in the history of the U.S., and then it started sparking around the world. I'm using spark a lot today, I guess, because it's a fire. Hello. Yeah. All right. Anyway, <laughs> these are things that we're still arguing over 100 years later, by the way. Yes. Worker safety, these kind of things. Trigger uh -huh. warning, obviously fire, death by fire. Also, death at the workplace. It's a thing some people have been through. I've been through that. I don't know if you've ever worked someplace where someone died. It's traumatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, somebody just died recently in an Amazon warehouse trying to help us all get our Prime Day deals. Wow. Yeah. I it's still say, a thing, y'all. I want to say, I'm as guilty as you were of everything. Like, because I like to buy cheap shit. I love Amazon. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We're, we're in a heat wave. I don't want to walk around in 99 degree yeah. heat. Oh yeah, me, I'm not. I'm not on a high horse here. No, we're not. I have. I am like. I have an Amazon package like every day. Like yeah. I'm. I'm the worst. I totally acknowledge. But this. I want them to be paid more, and I, I'm willing yes. to, to spend a few more pennies or dollars, whatever it is, in Same. order to make sure people are safe. 
they have their health care that they need, that they're yes. not, if they get injured at work, that there's compensation, yes. which is a thing that didn't occur before either. People still argue over that, by the way. Mm-hmm. We'll get, we might get into that later. But let me talk about resources because you could see there's a lot. Yeah. Woo! History.com, history.com video. There's, there's links to everything in the show notes. The Triangle Fire Memorial, the AFL-CIO, Britannica, New York Public Library. There was a 1979 TV movie, Sonia. I don't know if you ever saw it. <gasps> and it was called The Triangle Factory Scandal. I saw this sometime in the 80s. At, you know, after school, they would show movies or on the weekends. Yes, yeah. I don't, but I don't remember this one. Tom Bosley played the boss. And this fucking terrified me. This got me all Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Cunningham. CBS News, Smithsonian, the 1911 Triangle Fire. They have interviews with people that went through it at the time. They've recorded everything. It's incredible. U.S. Department of Labor, Triangle, the Fire that Changed America by David Von Drell. Just a couple more. Mm -hmm. HBO, HBO Max. They have a a 30-minute documentary, Triangle, Remembering the Fire. And mm. PBS American Experience Triangle Fire. This is a topic a lot of people yeah. talk about. They revisit. It's one of the biggest tragedies. And let's just get into it. New York City has always been the place for immigrants. I mean, LOL, it also was colonized. So people kind of forced themselves onto the land. We, mm-hmm. have, we do have that history. Around the 1840s, it became a place where the, there was the Irish potato famine and a lot of Irish people showed up. Chinese people showed up in the late 1800s and then early 1900s. There was a history of Jewish people being chased out of their cities throughout Russia, the Ukraine, Poland, mm-hmm. and would come to New York, New York. Italians, there was Mount Vesuvius, which was near Sicily. That exploded, and that had that killed all the crops there. So people were like, "Fuck it, I'll go to New York. I'm gonna be a famous, <laughs> be a that's, good seller." That's a uh, that's some serious House of Gucci accent you got going oh, there. Best. <laughs> Everyone in House of Gucci had a different accent. By the way, by the way, it, it was, was so amazing. Good. I love that movie so much. The, so if you remember the movie Gangs of New York, there were gangs that were running around yes. the city. Then what had to happen was we had to create a system. There had to be a mayor. They had to be political people in charge. You needed a fire department, a police department. People used to pay to be a policeman, Sonia. If Ooh. you wanted to just be a regular cop, it was like 100 bucks. Still a lot of money in 1905, mm-hmm. 1906, but you were guaranteed a badge. If you paid $1,500, you got to be a detective. So who got Ooh. to be a detective? People who had money. Yes. There's also the Tammany Hall and there's the political machine that's happening in New York. Lots of rotten Democrats who were running things at the time. And here's the thing with politics and politicians. And this is why we always rag on people to vote. They care about who votes. If you are a group of people and you don't vote, you're not going to be represented. It's it's shitty, but that's just how it is. They're supposed to represent everybody. And so there's grafting going on. There's people paying off the police. They're paying off politicians. It's great. Also, what's happening, uh, women aren't given the right to vote until 1919 or 1920. It was the 20th, 19th Amendment, excuse me. All these women are starting to enter the workforce. All these women are coming in from all over the world, and they're working in the garment industry. And they're being paid a dollar a week, two dollars a week. They're working twelve to fourteen hour days. They called them sweatshops because they got, they sweat their asses off in yes. them. They were they were pushed in there. They had tables just full of machines, and these just women worked on them day and night. And if you did something wrong, if a button was wrong or whatever, you would get docked your pay. It's so fucked up. It's so fucked up. If you got injured, they sent you home, and you may have gotten fired that day too. Yeah, that's what you get for getting injured. That's what you get. No bathroom breaks. There's a lot of places there was no ventilation. It was fucking awful. Yeah. And some people did it for a few years and then you try to do something else. Whatever. Fire safety is actually far more advanced than you would realize at the time. This The building that we're talking about today was built to be fireproof. The building made it it's you got to remember it's the people inside the building 
yes. that you're really trying to oh, protect. Oh, good. <laughs> so glad the building's safe. <laughs> the Phew. Thing was, Phew. They had sprinkler systems in 1911. They had an idea of like what it took, what made fire, what made fires spread so quickly, how to stop them. That you needed fire rails, that you needed special stairwells, that people needed. The police, the fire department would come by and say, y'all need to have sprinklers in this place and you need to spend the money. You need to have sprinklers. You need to have regular fire drills. And they're like, nah, that costs money. Forget it. Mm -hmm. It's not worth it. In 1909, there's a series of strikes. And Sonia's going to talk about somebody at the end of the show who's our non-creep about that, who led that. But there was this idea of like, hey... We can make more money if we all band together and we can have more safety involved. We can be involved in those practices that save our lives and make people money, make them a shitload of money. Right. (sighs) So the Ash Building is at Washington Place. They say Lower East Side. It's actually more like the village. It's where NYU is now. Okay. Which is where Law and Order, they have all their campus crimes take place at one place and it's at NYU. They film it. Of course. March 25th, 1911, it's a beautiful spring day. It's a Saturday. And, the, uh, and there's the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor. And the 8th and 9th floor, that's where all the sewing happened. And then the 10th floor was where all the business took place. That was where business time was. Mm. And they had our business, owners. Business up top, party at the bottom. Exactly. Exactly. And we have our owners who are at the top of the building, and they're there with their kids, and it's, like I said, it's a Saturday, so they get off. They only have to work 8 to 4 that day. Wee! What a treat! What a special treat for them. I should also say, the owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory were the owners Max Blank and Isaac Harris. They had been, they were Russian Jews. They came to America, started at the bottom, worked their way up. Mm-hmm. And they, a couple of times, had mysterious fires happen at their factories in the middle of the night when no one is there. And then they made insurance money. And it just happened to be around the end of the season when they couldn't sell things. How Odd. mysterious. Curious, right? It's a, that's a mystery. They, hmm. all of the other factory waist, the shirt waist people, all the, those garment people, did give in to the demands and, gave, and offered more money and better conditions, except for the triangle people. But they said... Everyone else is paying you $8 a week. We'll, char- we'll pay you $10 a week. Score. All right. The only thing, and they had us also, like I said, it's 8th floor and ninth floor they were working. And it's looking over the city. They had gigantic ceilings. They had big windows. They could open up the windows and get some air. It was actually not too bad as sweatshops go. <laughs> and I, I really like that as a out of context quote. Yeah. It's not too bad for as far as sweatshops You're gonna go. You're going to work for a dollar, two dollars a day, all day, sewing. It's well, not, at least you got a view. You got a view. And I think they had yeah. toilets on that floor. I mean, it was like there was. Oh, <gasps> what? How fucking bougie. It is. Mostly Russian Jews or Jewish people and Italians are working there. So there's a lot of Yiddish and Italian. And one of these things these men did was they didn't trust their workers because they were paying them so much, Sonia, so they felt like it was okay to treat them a particular way. Sure, they're just rolling in it. They inspected their purses as they came in and as they left. And I worked retail, a lot of places do that, but... Yeah. They had two men who would inspect their purses in the morning, but they didn't want to pay two people to do it in the evening. So one guy had to do it in the evening. So they had one exit. So they would lock all the exits and the women had to line up and there'd be 250 to 300 of them a day working. Oh, my God. Waiting to leave. And they had to show your purse. Dude, you you just you fucking busted your ass all day. You just want to go home. You want to go home. You want to pee. You want to eat. Yeah. You're going to have to get up in the morning and do this shit again. Yeah. No real housewives to look forward to. You know, (laughs) what are you going to do? But this is, sucks. this is their lives. So on this date, and this is the thing, to this day, no one really knows what happened. So it was around 4.40 in the afternoon. So the day was done. And once again, it took a long time for people to get to change your clothes and then show them your purse and leave. And like, what is, like I said, lock doors and all that shit. So it just mm-hmm. took, and people are kind of being leisurely at Saturday afternoon. They get a whole day off on Sunday, Sonia. And mm, if you were, well, if you're a they mother. They have to pray. They have to go to church. 
And if you're a mother, you got to do all your shit you couldn't do during the week because you were yes. working all week. So it, yeah. it's, yeah, it's a real blast. Anyway, nobody knows how it started, but on the eighth floor, they had these bales of um, bins and it was full of cotton and scraps of clothing. And they had to hold every piece of scrap of clothing because if you fucked up, they would charge you for that. So they really yeah. like watched the scraps. Of- <laughs> Max is like, I know Max is like, what the fuck? Get out of my bag. Damn it, Max. There's one woman who went to the bathroom. She was changing. And then she comes out. And as soon as she comes out, she hears somebody said, oh, my God, there's a fire. And there were water buckets and water hoses, Sonia, on the floor. And a guy comes along, one of the foremen, he comes along and he pours water on it. And it makes the flames shoot up even (gasps) higher and spreads. So to this day, no one knows what happened. They, they either somebody just flicked a cigarette, and this is a time you should know women didn't smoke in public in nineteen eleven. Right. So none of these women are sneaking a cig by their yeah. sewing machine. They would be it would be scandalous. Right. And this guy, like I said, he just said he poured water, but it made it spread. So people wonder: Did somebody have alcohol in there? Did something sp- something make? Because it the fire just shot up. Yeah. And because it's cotton everywhere and fabric everywhere fire goes to fabric like that i mean it's worse than paper it just tears right through so the guy says to another guy that's there get the water hose they get the water hose but guess what the water hose doesn't have any water pressure because they never test it so they can't put it out and then this fire just spreads and women are jammed together at their machines and they can't leave Oh, my God. And this fire is spreading. And somebody manages to run up to the ninth floor. And at the ninth floor, they had the telephone bank. And they had a new woman working that day who didn't really know how to do it. And it's like, you know, one ringy dingy, two ringy dingy, like little yes. one at the thing. Yes. So she didn't know how it worked. And the girl that worked it was in, in a panic. So they had a machine. And they said it was like, uh, I don't know the name of it, but it was sort of like a fax machine. But what you did, you wrote on a piece of paper, and then it was connected to a piece of paper on another desk. And it was like ghostwriting. Like you would write something oh. would right up there. But you had to set a particular way on your paper and on their paper. And she's like, I don't know what the fuck to do. It's 1911. Oh, my gosh. I don't I'm, know this. I'm a teenager. I don't fucking understand. Yeah. So she writes fire. And it goes up there, and the person up there that sees it thinks it's a joke and thinks they're just goofing. <gasps> this woman doesn't think to call the fire department. She just panics. She just full uh, on has a panic. Because they haven't been trained either. They yes. don't know what to fucking they do. They don't know. And they're, she's probably a teenager. She doesn't fucking get it. This fire starts spreading eighth floor to the ninth floor and then up to the tenth floor. The men of the tenth floor were the men that ran everything and they were there one of them was there with his kids and they get on the ceiling of the building the roof excuse me on the building. yeah they're not dancing on the ceiling they're up on the roof <laughs> and the building next door was a university and somebody took out a ladder and they put the ladder between the two buildings and they crawled on top oh and managed okay. to get away this doesn't help all the women inside no all the men and it's men and women that are inside the heat is really bad. The fire spreads. A lot of them, one of them that lived knew what to do because they used to have this happen in Russia where towns would be taken over and businesses would be burned. And she was taught, crawl on the ground if you're ever in a fire. And there's one woman, that's what she did. She hit the floor and she crawled her ass out of there. But a lot of them didn't know what to do. And they're running into one another. Oh, no. They're getting trapped in the stairwell. They must have been so scared. It's, it's scared. I mean, I can't even... I can't even imagine. Can't imagine. There was a fire. There was an elevator, and it was one of the first in New York City. They're all jamming the elevator. And now we know, don't go to the elevator. Yeah. Go to this. Just so you know, if you don't know that, if they say fire, yeah. hit the stairwell. Yeah. That's your best shot. They're going up and down in this elevator that's going by burning floors. And some of them are getting out. And then that gets overwhelmed and crashes. And then there's women that they, they don't know where the exits are. Like I said, the doors were locked and the doors swung in, so they couldn't shove out. They were locked uh. in. 
That's so terrifying. It's oh so, my gosh. This isn't even the worst part. They're terrified. And they call. So this by this time, the fire department shows up because everyone's calling from all over the city. And people are outside, like, trying to help. And the fire department shows up. And their water pressure on their hoses doesn't reach higher than a few floors. Aww. Nor the, the ladder that's attached to their fire truck only goes to the sixth floor. It does not go high enough to rescue these people that are on 8, 9, and 10. Yeah. Saturday afternoon, and then so people are just kind of walking around. It's a beautiful spring day, and then mayhem breaks out. Some lot of women, what happens in a fire is the fire eats up the oxygen. So it's taking your yeah. oxygen away from you. And it's burning you, so you're in pain. And so a lot of them... They think they're just doomed. So they jump. And they just jump out the building. The fire department had nets. And they tried to catch people, but they're way too high up in the air. It's just not prepared for that. There's a story about a group of men that were in the building next door that made a chain of themselves, like a ladder of themselves to go across, to get women to cross over them. But that fell. They fell. There were a lot of people who were brave, who really tried to help. At one point, a police officer told a reporter that he was told not to go outside because there were so many bodies falling. Oh, my God. And they hit the ground. It's like one ton of weight. It just smashes. And it's it's horrifying. And people witness this, and they're disgusted, and they're horrified. And immediately, so it's over 140, and many aren't identified because some of them are just solo people. Mm-hmm. Don't have family, or they, you know, a lot of them don't speak English. They speak Yiddish and Italian, but they don't speak yeah. English. And New York City is just fucking devastated by this. And it's so sad. It's, it's so terribly f- sad. And they have, a, by the Chelsea Piers, they have all these coffins and they have bodies in the coffins. And then people would say, like, oh, my mother had red hair. That's my mother. They would see, you know, the type of shoes mm-hmm. they were wearing by clothes there was one woman they found it was this woman's mother and she had two years worth of pay in her stockings and the guy said to her why didn't she have this in a bank and she didn't even know what the word bank meant because she was just right. so new to america she's like i don't know that's where mother kept oh her money I, right it's just it's just so horrifying those that did make it ran home mm-hmm. and then you explain to your family like what just happened to you. And I'm sure that's just completely. Um, like I said, two of the youngest were 14 years old. Many, there were quite a few people who remained unidentified. There were seven people who remained unidentified for decades until they had further testing. There are memorials around New York to this day to this event. But people were disgusted. There's, yeah, there's, this is like this. There's a man that lost his wife and his two daughters. This is these are the people that like make the city work. Right. And it could have been avoided. avoided. This is avoided. Yes. Avoided. These yeah. Are young just, women. They're it's just it's a result of fucking greed. Yes. Like it's disgusting. It's horrifying. New Yorkers are, are mad. They want to, they, you know, there've been strikes, but now this is something that's really kind of made people go, holy shit, we got to get serious about this. Yeah. On April 5th, 1911, 350,000 family members and garment workers and union members marched through the city in a funeral procession. And it went from the top of the city right on down the middle. Everybody dressed in black, all the horses and the carriages all in black Millions of people watch them walk by. And it's like cold, pissing, hard rain. Mm. But everybody was devastated. by it. The whole city felt it. At the Metropolitan Opera House, there was also a memorial. And there was sort of like this religious, not religious service. It was just a place. And a lot of activists came in there and like, what the fuck are you people yeah. doing about this shit? What are you, who are you, like, so the progressives finally have, you know, this thing that makes everybody go okay this is worth a few bucks this is worth something. yes because of that there are all kinds of laws then pass right away it changes which is great and this is why if you've ever worked in an office building and all of a sudden you have a they have a fire drill 
it's one of the this is why and yeah. i'm one of those people that that spaces out and doesn't remember anything but <laughs> i bid through enough of them to know you go you go down you don't go to the elevator go down the yes. stairs i know that yeah and they have special lights that come on and shit anyway the triangle owners max blank and isaac harris people want their heads i mean they're just what i the bet fuck? y'all lock these women in what the fuck is wrong with you they hire Max Stoyer to defend him. And Max Stoyer is a dude also from Russia, came to America and worked his way up. And he was like born to be a lawyer. He's just a shark. He just smells an opportunity, and goes for it. Mm. The DA, which was still under the old administration, charges them with manslaughter for like six bodies. They're charged for locking the doors. By Christmas of the year, De- December of the year, that's when the De- December 1911, they have this trial. Dozens and dozens of witnesses are called. And Max yeah. Stoyer just completely freaks out a lot of women on the stand. He makes them sound, some of them just, their English is not their first language. Some right. of them are just off the boats or they're just whatever. Yeah. And they're scared and they're intimidated. They don't want their name in the paper and then not be able to find a job. I mean, a lot of them yes. are just terrified, but they're just talking about. And he got people so kind of mixed up that the jury was kind of like, well, did they lock the doors or didn't they lock the doors? Maybe something else, you know, made this happen. I don't know. And in the end, they actually, one woman, he berated so badly because he said, you keep saying the same story over and over again, exactly word for word. You must be lying. And it's like, no. Or it's the it, opposite. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe <laughs> she really speaks Italian and she's really trying to be a fucking what a asshole. Fucking, what a fucking creep. I can't with these people. So anyway, but I mean, he's doing his job. The men were found not guilty, Sonia. Who knows what happened? The door locked itself. Yes, that must be it. It was a fucking ghost. A ghost did it. Fuck these people. They were sued by the families, were made to pay $75 for each person that was killed. That's $2,300 in today's money. That's such bullshit. The men filed an insurance claim, and they earned $400 per casualty. So what they the fuck? made, in essence, about a half a million dollars from this tragedy. So they're able to rebuild again. They're probably the ones that started the fire in the first place, like no, they had done years past. I don't think so, because they were both in the building. Oh, and they valid. were there with their kids. Valid, valid point. So if, even if they arranged something, it doesn't make any sense to do it. They never yeah. did during the daytime. They would have done it overnight. That's how okay. they would have done things. Okay, so I'll give them the they're... benefit. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt this time. In 1913, Max Blank was arrested for having his doors locked once again on a sweatshop that he ran. Fucking, and fucking asshole. He paid a $20 fine. Ooh! I hope the city didn't spend it all in one place. And the judge actually apologized to him for having to force a <laughs> fine on him. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Mm. I know. Because of all this, and this is a horrible event, but there were there was now workers' rights. Now we have yeah. things like paid time off and vacation days. I mean, nice things like that, but also like they have lights in the hallway that'll come on if there's a fire so you can find yes. your ass out of there. There's workers' compensation. So if you get injured or killed at your job, there is some sort of compensation. Yes. There are things that happen. And there also was a thing, by the way, Sonia, it became a big deal to have a union label on your clothes because it showed that you mm-hmm. cared about workers' rights. Yes. Max Blank was guilty of putting up counterfeit labels on clothes that said union, even though he didn't have a fucking union. Oh, my God. Is due to such an asshole. They both are. They both kind of go off into ex- obscurity. He he moves. Max Blank moves to the West Coast. Isaac Harris goes back to like shoemaking or something like that. They kind of just mm-hmm. fade away. But every year on March 25th, there's a bell rung at the very site that it happened. And they say the name of each person that died. And New Yorkers don't forget it. And it's a very important. Like I said, there's lots of stuff out there. I guess you could check the page for yourself or all the links and stuff like that but that's our creep today it's sort of multiple creeps it's a creepy event but yeah max blank and isaac harris fuck them yeah fuck those guys good job margo thank you they're serious creeps it's just completely terrifying and i can't imagine it's just and witnessing it and that's the thing because thousands of people were on the street 
yeah. and saw it happen, and they couldn't do anything. I mean, I, I, I those 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 women they must have been so terrified and then terrified, and then to be like on the street and feel so helpless to do anything to help them must have been there. It's, it's awful horrible. all the way around. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing good about it. I mean, it's all no. really ter- and like I said, they had sprinkler systems at the time. They yeah. just want to pay for them. Fuck these people. Yeah, greed is not good. I don't care what Gordon Gecko says. All right, let's take a quick break, and then Sonia's going to talk about our non creep this week. Will do. Margot, do you know who Clara Lemlich is? I do but i want to hear it from you yeah so this is a not a creep suggestion that came from margo she did my work for me i love it when that (laughs) happens uh she is someone who rose to power in the women's labor movement she became a voice that incited the famous uprising of the Twenty Thousand in 1909 badass she was born in 1886 in the u in the ukraine uh, her family, they faced a lot of poverty. There was a lot, there was an increase in anti-Jewish violence. So her family fled the Ukraine in 1903 and they uh, moved to the United States. And she was working in a textile manufacturing job like we just talked about. Um, she got that job two weeks after arriving in New York. And I think she was 17 years old at the point at this point um she was working in a gotham shirt waist factory she worked 11 hours a day six days a week Jesus. for three dollars a week it's crazy uh she had she wrote that the conditions reduced workers to the status of machines yeah like, I mean, that's what happens today too what's happening in yeah. silicon valley and around yeah, the world it's yeah. true yeah So she obviously super appalled by the working conditions. She joined uh, a local chapter of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. Nice. Um, And it was pretty new at the time, but it was starting to fight for workers' rights. She led picket lines. She wrote opinion pieces. This is a young woman who's like new to this country. Picket lines, wrote opinion pieces. She organized strikes to improve factory conditions. Um, very often her and her supporters were beat up by the police mm-hmm. and, uh, or people hired by the factory owners to beat them up. Which were sometimes um, and, off-duty policemen. Yes, exactly. Some shit hasn't changed, by the way. Right. Had to go to the hospital. She was hospitalized at one point because she was beaten so bad while standing in a picket line. It's fucked up. That's super you, just fucked wa- up. you just want a good working conditions, and this is what happens. That's what she's fighting for, by the way. Yes. Yeah. By the way, yeah, she's not like, hey, like, I want a fucking bougie, cushy job. <laughs> like, she just wants fucking ventilation and decent pay and working. Like, a it's bathroom bullshit. break. A bathroom yeah. break, really. Yeah, can I maybe use a bathroom sometimes? No! <laughs> That's the worst. Like, ugh. So, on November 22nd, uh, 1909, she stood up in front of, like, thousands of fellow female workers. Um, This was at the Cooper Union in New York City. And she was speaking in Yiddish. That was her native language. Mm -hmm. And she demanded a strike. She's 23. This this boggles my mind. What were you doing at 23, (laughs) Margo? Basically, what, working at the mall? I don't know. I'm like, yeah, I was working at the movie theater (laughs) and being like, oh, no, I have to stay up late to finish my paper for my journalism class. Woe is me. Meanwhile, she's doing this. It's so crazy. So she stood up in front of all these people, got them all riled up. The next morning, uh, her and 15,000, 15,000 factory workers stood on the streets of New York and protested for better wages and working conditions. The strike was later dubbed the Uprising of 20,000. It lasted for over two months. Wow. Yeah. And it just, it changed everything. It transformed the culture for workers. Um, They won concessions for uh, fair wages, shorter hours. She started a whole workers' revolution, basically, what she did. 
in the years following the fire that Margot just talked about, um, she continued to fight for workers' rights. She actually, at one point, she um, became really active in the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Um, She worked uh, for women's suffrage. Uh, Eventually, she left the union, though, because... She was more into communism than the union. <laughs> Apparently, she made a choice. Okay, um, you know, whatever. Yeah, choice, but okay. Uh, yeah, at some point. So, in 1913, she married a man named Joe uh, Shovelson, and he was like a printers' union activist. Um, they had three kids together. She was always speaking on behalf of several causes. She led a nationwide food strike during uh, World War One when the uh, food prices were inflated. Throughout the 1940s, she was uh, on the American Committee to Survey Trade Union Conditions in Europe. Like, she was just an organizer all around. She was an organizer for the American League Against War and Fascism. And here's one of my favorite things. So at 81, she's she's 81 now. So remember, we had little little baby right. at the beginning. Now, here she is, 81. She's staying in a Jewish home for the aged that's what they called it, in Los Angeles, as a resident, persuaded the management to join the United Farmers Workers Boycotts of Grape and Lettuce. (laughs) And she helped organize the the orderlies at the home to form their own labor union. Holy shit. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. She died on July 2nd, 1982. Jesus. She was 96. Holy shit. Right? Right? This was a really good pick on your <laughs> part, Margo. I can't even take credit. I was like, Margo's like, I think you'll like her. And I was like, mm, okay, thanks. Thanks for doing my work for me. And then I like read it and I was like, she's badass. She's badass. I mean, I'll tell you what I'm not doing when I'm 81, organizing unions. I'm going to be at the fucking Olive Garden getting shitty with (laughs) Margot. That's our show this week. Thank you, Sonia, for bringing us, uplifting us after a tough story. Thank you for the pick. If you like the sound of our voices, we also co-host a podcast called Dorking Out, where we dork out about movies. Sonia, what's the next movie? I'm really excited. Okay, I know every week I'm like, I'm really excited about... First of all, we're talking about Parenthood, which a movie I super love. Yep. But we're being joined by Adam Risky from F This Movie, and he's already been texting me, texting both of us, like, thoughts about the movie. And I was like, (laughs) this is going to be fucking gold. I can't wait. It's going to be so fun. Uh, What? (laughs) I was like, I had a brain fart. Sorry. It's (laughs) hot. It's really hot where Margo is. It's the hot where the Margo is. I'm looking at my computer and it just went 99 degrees and then it just said rain's coming. I'm like, oh, for God's sake. Oh, man. Oh, thank you. Okay. Anyway, if you have suggestions for creeps and non-creeps, we love it when you use social media and you use the Andy Potts gif. We got one from Ghostbusters. You could do that or you can think of something 